Let me be the first to say that with a fearless and determined mindset, your internship this summer in DC can be the next step towards fulfilling your dreams. My name is Katie Porter, and I'm so lucky to be here today as a Claire Booth Luce Fellow. I will be a junior next year at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Although I was nervous to come across the country for the summer, partly because of the humidity, I feel calmed and inspired by the presence and example of our next speaker, Cleta Mitchell, who is testament to the wonderful life that can be created through the right mindset. You may recognize her as February's conservative woman, woman in Claire Booth Blues Policy Institute's 2016 Great American Conservative Women Calendar or from your TV screen. She is known in D.C. and across the country for her work as a political law attorney at Foley and Lardner LLP. She has served as legal counsel for the National Republican Senatorial Committee, the National Republican Congressional Committee, and the National Rifle Association. While most people try to avoid the IRS, she gained national attention when she filed a lawsuit against them for their unlawful targeting of conservative nonprofit organizations. From the beginning, she had vision and leadership qualities that set her apart. In 1971, she was one of the five original governors of the Oklahoma Women's Political Caucus. Since receiving her BA and JD from the University of Oklahoma, she has created an impressive list of accolades for her hard work as a lawyer and leader in the conservative movement. Her focus on being respected rather than being liked and her hardworking attitude empowers young women everywhere, including me. She shows us that if she can help the conservative movement be lawfully respected countrywide, then I and all of us can do it in our communities and schools, and possibly even in California. Please help me in giving a very warm welcome to Cleta Mitchell. Thank you all very much. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. I am wearing my Leadership Institute scarf. How many of you are familiar with the Leadership Institute? I thought there might be some LI alums around here. Um, and you know, it says that one of the characters in Steel Magnolia says, our ability to accessorize is the only thing that separates from the animals. So, um, <laughs> So I wore my accessory. I am. I thank you so much for that introduction and for hosting me. Uh, we were trying to figure out when we were supposed to make our appearance, our entrance. So I hope we. I think we did it just right. So um, I am going to talk to you today about respect, uh, R E S P E C T, because I think it's important, particularly for women, and particularly for young women, but old women too, like me, to remember that everyone wants to be liked, but I mean, even the, most, even the most unlovable person still wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be loved. It's a natural human emotion. So we all grow up thinking about that. We all think about um, how we want to be liked. Remember in grade school when you pass the notes, do you like me? Uh, and remember all the, uh, the whispering, whether it's the click of the girls that you're with or when you first decided that boys weren't as icky as you originally thought, and does he like me? Do I like him? I mean, and he likes you. Did you know he likes you? Remember all that? And all our lives we worry about whether or not people like us, whether uh, people love us, and we want, we, we want people to say, um, I really like her. I really, really like her. And that's what we worry about. But I'm here today to ask you, is that really something to aspire to? I remember a number of years ago, my husband and I uh, were uh, going to the funeral of a good friend of his. Uh, a fellow who had had a heart attack and died pretty early in his life. But um, he, th this guy, I didn't really know him very well, but he'd been a good friend of my husband's. And he was a, a character. And my husband tells these hilarious stories about this guy and the, and the scrapes he would get into. I mean, he's straight out of a Chevy Chase movie. But, so we, but he died suddenly, and we went to his funeral. And... Um, one of my husband's best friends, who also knew the, this person pretty well, uh, went with us. So the three of us were coming out of the funeral, and on the steps of the church, my friend's, uh, my husband's friend, the kind of musing aloud to himself, said, you know, I really always liked McCann. I just never could find a reason to respect him. And I was so struck by that comment. It just made me think, stop and think about the difference between being liked 
and being respected. And since we don't really grow up with the idea of, okay, I really want somebody to respect us. There was never a time when you were passing those notes that you said, do you respect Susie? That just isn't in our mindset. So that's what I want to talk about today is the difference between like and respect. And I want to focus on three things regarding respect. The first one is this, these are three principles that I believe. Number one, it is better to be respected than liked. Now, man, that is a really hard concept to accept. We can say that, we believe that, but that's really, really hard to act out in our daily lives, especially, I think, for girls. You know, sugar and spice and everything nice, that's what little girls are made of. I mean, we're, we're supposedly, how in the world is it possible for us to say we'd rather be respected than liked? Because we really want people to like us. Um, and I want you to think about, have you ever known, have you ever had friends that you really liked, but you knew you couldn't count on them? You know, always late, you know, supposed to bring the, the whatever and shows up without it, so everybody always knows that she's never going to be able to be counted on, and so everybody else fills in because they call that the power of helplessness, by the way, because that's a certain power that this person who's helpless has over everybody else because everybody else fills in the, the gaps for somebody. But, you know, you really like her because she's a lot of fun, but deep down you just really can't find a reason to respect her, just like my f husband's friend said about the person who had died. But if we have, if we've been raised right, if we've been raised properly, then we, we have principles that we've been taught through our parents, our churches, our institutions that still believe that there are uh, eternal abiding principles, things like integrity, truth, honor, cleanliness, punctuality, reliability, steadfastness, faith, commitment to principles, virtue. I mean, if we've been raised right, these are principles that we've been taught are important in our lives. And that's really, those concepts, that's really where um, the whole notion of respect comes from. And where in any of that does it say being liked? It's just not one of the time-honored principles that we've been taught. That's a human nature emotion, but it isn't one of the time-honored principles. It's not one of the, you know, the opposite of the seven deadly sins or any of that. I mean, in the beauty pageants, don't we all love Miss Congeniality? You know, she didn't have the best swimsuit or the talent or whatever, but she was voted on by her peers, and we love Miss Congeniality, right? I mean, there's always the, the person that they like, but she isn't quite as good as the, the others, so... I mean, there are times when you're going to be faced with situations where you have to decide, what do I do here? And I'm going to share one with you that is, was a very uh, searing experience for me. Um, I had moved to Washington from Oklahoma uh, 25 years ago, this year actually, to um, run a small nonprofit legal foundation uh, working on term limits for members of Congress. And I had defended the, uh, there were ballot issues in 23 states and I had represented a number of those states. I'd argued the case for term, congressional term limits before the Florida Supreme Court and the Arkansas Supreme Court and several lower courts. And now we had this case that was coming up from Arkansas and was going to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. 22 million people across the country had voted to impose term limits on their members of Congress uh, through state ballot initiatives. And this case was coming to the U.S. Supreme Court where the U.S. Supreme Court was going to decide whether this was constitutional or not. And when the Supreme Court accepted certiorari on the case, the Arkansas Attorney General, who had, had, had wanted nothing to do with the case when we were handling it before the Arkansas District Court and the Arkansas Supreme Court, he, 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 uh, he, basically, he farmed it out to an outside lawyer who had no experience in constitutional law, although he was a really great guy and I got to be friends with him. And he, and he let me argue the case um, because he didn't have any idea what he was doing. But, uh, but he was a great guy. I liked him. And I actually respected him, but not for that. But um, <laughs> so now this case has come to the Supreme Court. Well, the moment that it was uh, accepted by this, this uh, petition for certiorari was accepted, then he, uh, the Attorney General, sees this now. This is a big national case, right? He's going to get to be on TV. He's going to get to be uh, front and center. The problem is he was an idiot. I mean, a complete moron. 
I literally paid. I was running this little uh, nonprofit legal foundation. I literally paid a a history professor scholar to go to Arkansas and spend time with him to try to teach him what the Bill of Rights was and constitutional principles. I mean, the guy was a complete idiot. But I thought, well, you know, he is the attorney general. The people elected him, you know. So, so he comes up, and we do the. We have these moot courts. They call these moot courts where you will have a panel of people who are familiar with the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, I don't know if you've ever been to a Supreme Court argument, um, and unfortunately you don't get to go to one because they don't have them in the summer. Um, and they, the, you can, you'll get one sentence, maybe, out of your mouth before a justice starts asking you questions. And so they do the, we had these moot courts. And before the first moot court, it became pretty darn clear that this guy was in so far over his head that there was no way he was going to be argued this case on behalf of the 22 million Americans who had voted to support ter to Im impose term limits by law or constitution in their states. And I was so, I watched this thing all day long, and I mean, I went home that night, and I was, I could not sleep. I could not sleep because... I thought, and we had another day of argument, of, of moot court prep the next day before the arguments at the following day. And I said, uh, I, and I said I, I've got to say something. I've got to try to do something, see if we can get somebody else to do this argument. And we had a fellow who was, had been at, had argued nine cases before the U.S. Supreme Court who was helping us. Had, had, he and I had worked on the brief that we filed, and he knew everything inside and out, and he knew the court, he, he would have been perfect to, to do the argument. And it, he could step in instantly because he was that skilled and that experienced and that good. And so I start calling, I call the Attorney General's Chief of Staff and I said, his, the guy's name is Winston Bryant. There's no reason you would ever need to know that, but if you ever do, y you will know he is the moron idiot. Uh, but um, he thought this was going to parlay him into the United States Senate. He lost his race for the Senate, fortunately. But um, anyway, I said, you know, Winston is just, he is not up to this. He cannot handle this argument. And so I said, you've got to do something. The chief of staff said, well, I can't tell him that. I said, well, why not? You work for him. He said, I just can't tell him that. He said, he won't listen. I can't tell him that. I said, well, who might be able to tell him that? He goes, I don't know. Maybe you. I said, I don't even know the guy. He said, well, none of us can tell him. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And I finally thought, you know what? So here's what I thought. I decided I've been working on this for several years. I've moved my family across the country for this issue, for this principle. And if I don't say something, I have to do everything I can to try to make sure that we have the best shot we can possibly have at the Supreme Court. And I thought to myself, you are not running for Miss Congeniality. It doesn't matter if you make him mad. You, are, you have to suck it up and tell him and see if you can get him to step aside. So the next morning, after my sleepless night, I went in and I said, before we start, I said to the attorney general, I said, General, could we talk in the kitchen for a minute? And I, and I just said, you know what, General, I know you've worked hard on this, but this, this is not your cup of tea. And we need to let Paul Larkin, who's argued nine cases for the Supreme Court, it's a clique, it's, a, it's an insider's group, let him step in, he'll be ready, and he can do this. And I said, all these people are counting on you, and that would be the best thing you could do, and the wisest, best thing you could possibly do. And he uh, is to step aside and let Paul handle, uh, do the argument tomorrow. And you'll be happy to know that he looked at me, and turned around and walked out. I didn't say a word. So I thought, well, okay, we're going to have to suck it up and deal with what we got. But I, but I knew. But here's the thing. I knew I was not going to be 80 years old thinking, what if? What if? And we lost the case by one vote. I don't know if that made a difference, but I will say this. So I, I had studied this. I knew it inside and out. But I wasn't even asking for myself to do the argument. I was asking for somebody else to do it. And he, he just wouldn't hear of it. But I thought, well, I knew, that the, I knew Justice Kennedy had written a, the majority opinion in a certain case from California, and it was likely that that would be a question Justice Kennedy would ask. So in the, in the practice session that day, I said, all right, now here's the question, da-da-da-da-da, and here's the answer. 
And I said, we practiced that, right? So we go into the argument the next day. He, the Attorney General hadn't started talking three words before Justice Kennedy interrupted and asked the very question that I had said Justice Kennedy was likely to ask. And you know what the Attorney General did? He just looked at him like a deer in the headlights, couldn't even think what to say, and completely garbled it. Anyway, we lost the case, and that guy lost his race for the United States Senate. But I will tell you something. The, it was the hardest thing for me to be able to do that because I knew this guy was going to hate me, but I had to tell myself, I'm not running for miscongeniality. And I think that that's really important for you to think about those situations. When my daughter was in high school, well, actually she was in middle school, uh, when the whole Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal erupted, you guys are probably three, um, but um, my daughter didn't tell me this at first. Uh, but I mean, I used to always try to tell my daughter that it is important to stand up for principle and to believe in these certain things. And um, so she's in her family life class in the eighth grade, and it's a girls' school. And so uh, my daughter didn't come home and tell me this right away. It was several weeks later, and she said that the teacher asked, um, you know, if anybody had been, they obviously been all following this, it was all over the news because it was pretty, uh, this was a lovely time in America where you had the news all being about the President of the United States and sexual activity with a 19 year old intern. That was great. And um, so the teacher said, uh, so what do you think about this? And my daughter raised her hand and said, I, and she said, I think he should resign. And the teacher said, what? And she said, well, yes, because if he were the president of anything else, any company, any other country, he would have to resign just for the sheer shame of these allegations. And of course, at this time, Bill Clinton was denying it, and Hillary was saying that it was all a fabrication of the vast right-wing conspiracy. That's where that term came from. She went on the Today Show and said it was the vast right-wing conspiracy. He was just saying these ugly things about my husband. And... Um, <laughs> And so, um, you know, the teacher asked, uh, well, what, he's not, he hasn't been charged with anything, he hasn't been convicted, and my daughter said, it doesn't matter. He, he, the shame of this, he should resign, he should step down. And so the teacher then says, well, how many of you agree with that? And not another hand went up. Does that sound familiar in your classes? And my daughter, and I said to my daughter, the usual mom, mom thing, how did that make you feel? My daughter looks at me and goes, I'm right there wrong. So imagine a few months later, she was coming out from summer camp, and I said, did you see what happened? You know, you've been vindicated. I said, doesn't that make you feel vindicated? She said, oh, Mom, I always knew I was right. <laughs> so uh, a few years later, in high school, she was having some, there was some girl in her group, and they were having something, and I said, well, you know, this girl was, I don't even remember now what she'd done, but, um, you know, I said, well, you know, she's, she's a nice girl, right? My daughter's name is Margaret. I said, Margaret, she's, she's a nice girl. My daughter looked, and she goes, nice is overrated. And I thought, I have raised a great daughter. So <laughs> the respect. It's more important than being liked. And remember what the Bible says is that a virtuous woman is more precious than rubies. So it's number one principle, it's more important to be respected than liked. Number two, respect can only be earned. You can't require it. You can't demand it. You can't pay for it. You can't buy it. It can only be earned. And that's a really f interesting thing, isn't it? You have to be, in order for people to respect you, you have to be respectable, respect-able. Um, so I'll give you some tips on that. When I was first learning to play golf, my husband said, I'm going to give you three most important things about, about golf. I'm thinking, okay, this is good. It's taken me a long time, and I'm still not very good, but I do love playing golf. Um, he said, here are the three things that matter. Um, now, you're probably going to think that he was telling me things about how to putt or some fundamental thing. No, here are the things my husband told me. He said, number one, you have to dress properly. Uh, if you're going to play golf, you have to dress properly. I'm thinking shopping opportunity. Um, <laughs> he said, number two, you have to know the etiquette. Not the rules, but the etiquette. How to get along on the golf course with other people. Rake your traps, fix your divots, know where to put the rake, uh, don't walk in anybody's line. Uh, all of those kinds of things. And the third thing he said was, don't hold anybody up. Don't delay the people around you because you're so focused on your own, on your own game that you forget the people around you. So these are pretty good lessons, I think, for getting along in life and, and being respectable. The first thing, um, dressing properly. Now, I'm a big believer in that. Um, I'm still not used to Jeans Fridays at my law firm, and so I just don't participate in that. And uh, I've been a 
uh, chapter advisor at two different Chi Omega chapters, and um, the thing that we always have to argue about is whether or not we're going to allow uh, the members to wear jeans to chapter meetings when they have to wear their pins. And, you know, if you show up in flip-flops in the office, what does that say to people? When you're, you know, if you show up in, uh, th there's a uniform. There are uniforms that people wear depending on their work. Um, if you're a carpenter or a painter or whatever, there's a uniform that you wear. Um, and there's a uniform that you wear if you, wa if you want to be a professional person. Now, I realize that in some professions, you know, graphic artists and things like that, that it's not quite the same uh, dress code as uh, those of us who are in the legal profession, for instance. But if the first thing that flashes into somebody's minds when you show up is your belly button with or without the ring, I mean, that, that's what they're going to focus on. And what is the old saying? That you have uh, only one time to make a first impression? and uh, that opinions are formed about another person in the first 10 seconds. My mother used to always tell me that if your hair is clean and your shoes are shined and uh, you have clean ironed clothes, then um, it didn't matter if you were wealthy because if you, you, would look, you could look nice uh, anyway. And um, I, I know that I used to, when my daughter was growing up and she'd have slumber parties, I would line the girls up when they are about seven or eight years old and I'd teach them how to shake hands. Because one of the things that drives me crazy is women not knowing how to shake hands. And it also drives me crazy to shake hands with a man who has a limp fist, <laughs> wrist, or who does this kind of Scarlett O'Hara, Rhett Butler little grasping <laughs> thing. And I've been known to grab a man's hand and say, shake my hand, you know, when he's kind of trying to do this little thing. I mean, like, oh, this is right by the <laughs> so, so you have to dress and act in a respectable manner. And uh, that is job number one, if you're going to be respectable. And knowing the etiquette, well, what does that mean? And as I said, in the, on the golf course, fixing your divots, not walking anybody's line, things like that. But it means that um, what are the principles to which you adhere? I think in daily life, not on the golf course, uh, the things that are going on around us that we should take responsibility for doing just because it's the right thing to do. Uh, James Baker, former Secretary of State, was the commencement speaker at my daughter's college graduation, and his topic was leadership is knowing what to do and then doing it. Leadership is knowing what to do and then doing it. In golf, it may be raking your traps and fixing your divots, but in life, it's knowing what to do in a situation and then doing it, even if it makes people not like you, even if it makes, it makes you uncomfortable. It's important to, if it's if you're going to be a leader, then you have to know what to do and do it, regardless of the consequences. And number three, about on the golf course, don't hold anybody up. In life, that means thinking about and anticipating what needs to happen. And it means that even if things aren't going your way, that you know when to keep, you know you got to keep moving. You got to keep going. In life, others will respect you only if you are respectable. And how you conduct yourself, even in the difficult times, is one of the things that people will either come to respect you for or decide that you're not worth respecting. And the final thing I will say to you, which is not so much a professional thing, but is, um, I think, is a personal thing. And I believe this very strongly. Uh, I assume that, um, and that is respect renews love. I'm a very big believer in that concept. You can be madly in love with somebody. And I presume that you're going to be searching for a life partner. Michelle and I both are very fortunate in that we have uh, been married to wonderful men for many, many decades. And um, I, I think it's a natural thing that, uh, and I believe in the sacrament of marriage. I believe that it is sanctified by God. And I would hope that you would find that life partner. But I will tell you that when you're looking for Mr. Wright, I would hope that you would ask yourself, if you find someone with whom you're madly in love, do you respect him? And what do you respect about him? Does he have a good work ethic? Does he have honesty, integrity? Is, is he faithful? Does he have good character? How does he treat his mother? What are his, you know, how, what are his manners? I mean, these are character traits that are important to a relationship. And I think a reason that, that people don't, um, that marriages don't survive in modern America is because we think that being madly in love is all it takes. But if you do not respect, I will just tell you this, if you, as I'm an old lady telling you young ones, if you do not respect the person with whom you're in love, over time you'll stop loving him. And it's the same thing with a, a place to work. 
If you go to work someplace and you don't respect the people you work for, they're not honest, they don't treat people well, you may love the work, but you're, not, you're going to be miserable there if you do not work for people that you respect. And they have to earn that, just like you have to earn it. So I just urge you that um, as you're thinking about where you work and, and what you do and, and who you love, that you need to think very seriously about, do I respect these people? Do I respect, respect this person? Because if you don't respect the environment, the people in your daily environment, over time, you're going to become miserable. So those are my three lessons. One, it's better to be respected than liked. Number two, um, what is number two? I know it's there. Oh, respect is uh, only going to be earned. You can't buy it. You can't earn it on, uh, get it online. To get it, you have to earn it. And number three, respect renews love. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful time in Washington. I'll be glad to answer questions. All right, anybody have a question? Don't be shy. Yes. Yep. Oh, are you doing microphones? Oh, okay. Well, okay, so we'll start back there and then come up here, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Stand up. Okay. Hi, Olivia. <laughs> so how have you seen your daughters conserve her values throughout um, her young adolescence? And so how have you seen like the values that you've instilled in her? How has she remained faithful throughout that, if you can speak on her part? Well, she's getting ready to turn 32 in about uh, two weeks. And um, she actually has the world's greatest dream job, although she's nearly killing herself. She's in London. And she is the buying brand manager for a, cosmet a cosmetics and skincare company called Space NK. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but anyway, so she buys makeup and skincare products for a living. I mean, how about that? But anyway, <laughs> but look, I mean, she, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of her, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that she ha is, uh, she, has, she works very hard, but she has strong character, and she, she married a wonderful person. Now, I will tell you, <laughs> She was transferred for one year from um, after her uh, after graduating from college. She t got a job at, with the Boston Consulting Group, and they trans she was in Dallas for two years, and then they transferred her for one year to Melbourne, Australia. And she'd been there about three months and met the love of her life. So she became an Australian citizen, and now, but now they at least moved to the Northern Hemisphere, um, and she, they live in London. But you know, I had several. There were several times during my daughter's life, uh, once when she was driving, she was a, either a junior or senior in high school, and she, um, she ran into somebody's car that was parked in front of their house, and it was their brand new car. And after a day or so, she came, she came home and then she to and told us about it and all, and then she said, you know, I need to go over and apologize. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm the, the lawyer, and you, you know, I said, do you want me to come with you? She said, no. I said, are you sure you want to do this? She said, well, I'll tell you what. If somebody just run into my new car, she said, I can tell you, I would, I, would, I would presume that they would come and apologize to me. And that's what she did. She went over there by herself. She knocked on the door, and she said, um, I'm the person that hit your car, and I'm really sorry, and we'll take care of it and all, but I just wanted to apologize to you. So this guy calls my husband and says, who is this person you've raised? And, you know, I was really very proud of her for that. And she's, you know, been, there have been times over the course of, the, of, of her life and the, where she's just done things that, you know, I think the main thing, I always kind of, I gave her this speech about it's better to be respected than liked. And people may not like you, but you've got to do the right thing, even when it's hard. And um, so I think the reason that she's been successful in business is because she has done that. She goes over and above the, the call of duty and um, she works really, really hard, and um, she tries to evidence those uh, principles. And I've made sure to always tell her, and actually it's very interesting, you know, I've, I've said to her, you know, you can't wear scuffed shoes if you're going to get ahead. And so she's, you know, she has said that one of the things that, um, that she's been told by her bosses is that they appreciate the fact that she does dress up, dress nicely, to come to work. So... You know, I think that the, I, I, I 
like I would like to claim some credit, but I actually think it's because you know she was raised in church and she we tried to teach her good values and to bear those through all of her her life. I hope she keeps doing that. <laughs> there was a question up here. Hi again, my name is Disha Martin. I'm from Howard University. Um, my question is, I feel like I've had a lot of challenges. I'm sure everyone here has had challenges in their classrooms with their friends, um, speaking on policy issues and politics. And for me, I feel like I haven't been respected or my voice isn't respected. So I know you talked about the difference between respected and liked. How do you get across respect or give respect and also receive it when talking about issues of politics? Well, look, I mean, I think the most important thing, and I know that you guys are faced with this in, um, in ways that are you know, tremendously worse, exponentially worse than when I was in college in the dark ages. But uh, in fact, there was a study this week that uh, by a ratio of 12 to 1, there are 12 liberal professors for every one conservative professor. I think that's actually a conservative estimate. But um, I'll just give you a couple of things. Number one, you have to, when you express your views, I think it's important to say, um, I asked my daughter once how um, she handled it in her college classes, and she said that she would raise her hand and say, now I was just thinking, I was, I'm thinking about what you just said, professor, and I'm trying to decide, is that, is what you, is that your opinion, or is that, a, or the, is that factual, is that, you're, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion, but is that, is that what that is? That's your opinion, or is that your, is that, uh, is this factual information you're presenting? And she said that usually they would bristle and say, uh, well, so do you have a different opinion? And she'd say, well, yes, I do. And then she would state her opinion. But I think it's important to say, to be able to say, number one, you better know your stuff. Because if you're going to go in to do battle with somebody, you can't just be mouthing off. They get to do that. We don't get to do that. We have to have facts, and we have to be prepared, and we have to study, and we have to be able to cite to things. Um, because they don't, they don't have to rely on any facts, they just are this mouthy, opinionated stuff that, you know, that they all hear and nod at each other. But I, I would say to you that if you do that, if you are just insistent upon, I would like to, I would like to just state for the record, I would just like to offer this information and based on dot, 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 and you can find that at blah, 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 or whatever. But if you state the facts, and, and you're not argumentative, but you are just saying, here are the facts. And you, you may have your opinion about that, professor, but here are the facts. One, two, three. If you just do that, I, remember I said that respect can't be, you can't demand it. But you will earn the respect of other people, number one, if you speak up, and number two, if you're prepared, and people will say, well, I may not agree with her, but she seems smart. That's better. That's really good. And so I think that that's really that you just, you have to know that you're always going to be in the minority. But you have to find friends and situations and colleagues who will um, reinforce you. That's what, that was one of the great things that happened in the early 90s with talk radio, was that conservatives who had felt that they were alone suddenly began to be reinforced and hear people on the radio, people calling in and people, radio hosts calling in and realizing they're saying things that, oh my gosh, this is what I have thought all these years. I thought I was the only one. And you might be surprised that there are other people in the class who are not willing to speak up. And maybe they will respect you and join with you. But, you know, you're not going to change the, these professors are tenured, or they're graduate students who are trying to get tenure, and they're never going to, they're always going to espouse a left-wing, socialist, anti-American philosophy. And you're not going to change their minds. But occasionally, sometimes it's just more than you can take. And I do think, you know, what people tend to do, what students tend to do is say, is this going to be on the test? And I think that you need to, and so that might be what say, well, if this, is this your opinion? If the, is your opinion going to, are we going to be graded 
on our ability to uh, give back to you your opinion because I just really need to know that. That gets them. Students will appreciate that part. Go ahead. Um, my name is Lexi Castaneda, and I'm just wondering, for um, what advice can you give for somebody who might be in a um, situation where they feel like they don't respect whether it's like a workplace or a friendship or a relationship, what advice do you have for either getting out of that or how to gain, or how to um, find a, pl a way to respect somebody that they maybe don't naturally respect? Or okay, you're gonna have to sort out the they and the this. Give, okay. me, give me an example. Okay, so um, let's say that you're working in a job and um, you really like your job, but you don't necessarily respect your boss as a person. Um, what advice do you have for a situation like that? Well, I think it depends on um, the imp the you know, it really is, every, every situation is unique. If you don't respect your boss as a person, it's one thing if that person doesn't impact how you do your work. Uh, it's another thing if that person impacts uh, and tries to get you to do things that you don't agree with or they're, they're, you know, violate your principles. So it really, it just depends on the individual situation. You're not going to love and respect everybody you work with. That is just not going to happen. But it just really depends on how much influence that person has and how you carry on your work and whether or not you can just kind of try to disregard the person or whether that person is trying to get you to do things in a manner in which you uh, find objectionable under your print on your principles. And after you've tried to, you know, make sure that this person knows they can't make you do things that you don't believe in and see how that goes, you know, you might have to leave. But sometimes you can get, you know, wicked people to leave you alone. Yes. Uh, my name's Devin Wood, and I was wondering if you could maybe speak to a personal um, experience you've had where you uh, maybe like the hardest uh, you've ever had to work to gain someone's respect or to gain a group's respect um, and how you face those challenges and maybe the steps that you went through? Well, I don't recall ever worrying about that. What I'm trying to say is if you just, you can't go out and say, okay, I'm going to do all this, so you'll respect me. That's a little bit getting into like. I, I mean, I think if you just do your work, do your job, do what you do, live your life, other people will come to respect you. And, you know, I don't think it's the kind of thing where you can do it. You're not doing a scorecard going around and saying, because that really gets into, do you, that really crosses over into whether they like you. So my view is that you stand up for principle and you, um, you do your work, I mean, under whatever conditions. And look, I mean, I'm in a situation where I work for a large law firm. I'm a partner in a very large law firm. It's like one of the 10th or 15th or whatever, largest law firms in America. And let me just tell you something. Everything big in America is not for us. It's the, whether it's a big law firm or a big university or big government, big banks, big consulting firms, big, 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 big. Anything, any company or entity that's big enough to have a a government relations director is not, that's so why I figured out working on term limits, they're just not for us. They're not conservative, they're socialist, they're politically correct, they're following the crowd, they're limits to the sea, it's all these darn businesses that a week ago were outraged because Donald, President Trump said we're not going to, you're not going to sell out America and be part of this Paris Accord and all these big companies are, oh, they're crying and gnashing their teeth. And, well, that's the environment in which I work. That's my place of employment. And you know, I do my practice with my conservative clients, and I do my work, and there are, and for the most part, I do just fine because I generate business, and, you know, my husband once told me, he said, if you just, if you have your own clients and generate business and, and generate revenue, they'll leave you alone, which turns out to be actually true, and, um, but there have been times when I've had to, um, I had one particular experience, I represented when the, when the gay rights movement began to move into uh, trying to get marriage redefined 
in sort of 1907, I mean 2007, 8, and 9 around the country, um, really without letting the people have much to say about it. Um, and to get so that marriage was defined in all the sta in statutes, or maybe it had never been defined at all. Um, but there was a group of, of ministers, black ministers, Latino ministers, uh, lay church leaders in, in Washington, D.C., who learned that the, D the D.C. City Council changed the definition of marriage by sticking a paragraph in a tax bill that was moving through the D.C. City Council. And these pastors and uh, lay uh, Christian leaders said, well, this is not right. And so they wanted to have a referendum and then a, um, a, a vote, an ultimate initiative. And they formed this thing called D.C. Stand for Marriage. And this was in 2008 or 9, and they came to me to help them try to get a referendum and then an election, an initiative on the redefinition of marriage, or the definition of marriage. And so I represented them. So I do my normal client intake of, you know, D.C. stand for marriage. This is a paying client. And so about two months later, I get a call from our head offices in Milwaukee, and I got a call from the head office uh, in Milwaukee. Fortunately, the person who is sort of the godfather of our firm is an orthodox, very devout Jewish man. And he called me and said, what is this client? Who is this? I said, well, I told him. I said, you know, he said, well, why, what are you doing for them? I said, well, I'm an election lawyer, and they want an election. So I'm trying to help figure out how to get an election. And I re he said, well, that there have been some questions raised. Well, it turns out that the Human Rights Campaign, which is this national uh, gay rights organization, had started going around and putting pressure on law firms to not, not represent any marriage effort, traditional marriage effort. And, I mean, this went on. I, I mean, this saga went on. I said, well, I'm an election lawyer and they won an election, and they're a paying client. I said, as opposed to, I learned subsequently, one of the arguments I learned was that we had lawyers in Wisconsin who were donating their time pro bono to the ACLU to overturn the definition of traditional marriage. I said, so here my clients are paying, and they are subsidizing the things they don't believe in by the pro bono work. And this fight went on for, uh, it went on for about two and a half years where the human rights campaign literally was putting pressure on my firm and getting other lawyers in my firm to go to the management committee to try to get the management committee to make me fire my clients. And I finally, I said to my husband, I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but if I have to leave, I will leave because I will not let these people tell me who I can and can't represent. But well, I'll tell you what ended up happening, it was very interesting, is that I, I finally got on an airplane and flew to Milwaukee and met with the CEO and, and our godfather. And I, said, and I said, you've got to stand up and fight, blah, 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 blah. And you know, they did that to Paul Clement, the former Solicitor General, when he was going to represent the House of Representatives uh, and their defen to defend DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and Coca-Cola, Remember one of those big companies I told you about, which is King and Spalding's biggest client, because they're based in Atlanta, um, said, you have to tell Paul Clement that he cannot represent the House of Representatives to protect the Defense of Marriage Act, or we, Coca-Cola, will remove our multi-million dollars in, in billings from King and Spalding. And Paul Clement said, well, that's fine. I'll just go and start my own firm, which he did, and it made headlines. I'm not Paul Clement, but anyway, what we finally, our management, com uh, our CEO and all that, we had a meeting December of 2011, and the compromise that we worked out, the deal we worked out is that neither side, the pro-marriage or anti-marriage, <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's anti-marriage, but gay marriage versus traditional marriage, that no attorney in the firm can represent either side uh, through work for the firm, either for pay or pro bono. If I want to affiliate with the Alliance Defending Freedom or some external public interest law firm, I can do that as long as they put me on their malpractice coverage. But, you know, but what's interesting is it meant that those clients that I had who'd been paying were now converted to, they got free legal work, 
And the most, the hilarious part is that since then, it's all the left wingers, the squishy, you know, the young people coming in as lawyers. They want to do all this work for these LGBTQ RSTV uh, entities and groups, and they find out they can't do that, and they're just horrified. And they say, "No, that's the deal." And I police that. Man, I police that. If I see something, I write to the CEO. And I say, "They're breaking the rule. They're breaking the policy." They're breaking the policy. They break the policy, I'm breaking the policy. But, so, you know, that there are always things like that. But you do have to be prepared to walk out the door. If, you know, and I don't, say, I don't say that lightly. I was glad that we resolved it. But it was painful for several years, let me tell you. And now they, I know that they review every case I bring in, every client I bring in. I know they look to see if it's going to cause a problem. You know, not my problem. <coughs> Anybody else? Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time left. Okay. Questions. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Have a great summer.